America Looks Abroad. Today, ladies and gentlemen, the Foreign Policy Association presents the 36th in its series of programs presented by staff members of the Foreign Policy Association. And in connection with the opening today of the Inter-American Conference in Cuba, we take you now to Havana. America Looks Abroad. This is the 36th in a series of broadcasts presented by the staff members of the Foreign Policy Association. Mr. Howard J. Trueblood and Mr. John I. B. McCullough, Latin American experts of the Association, are attending the meeting of the foreign ministers and will speak to you from Havana. Mr. Trueblood's subject is Economic Defense of the Americas. At the conclusion of his talk, Mr. McCullough will address a few words in Spanish to our Spanish-speaking audience. Mr. Trueblood. Good afternoon. In two quarters of an hour, the curtain will rise on what may be the most important event of the year in inter-American relations. For the second time within ten months, the foreign ministers of the American Republic are meeting to consider the problems arising from the European war. They are meeting to take specific action to mend the economic and diplomatic defense of the Western Hemisphere. At no time in the whole history of Pan-Americanism has the atmosphere been more foreboding. The 21 nations which are represented here at Havana realize fully that speech-making and demonstrations of mutual goodwill are not enough to protect the Americans. This conference promises to be far different from the leisurely Pan-American gatherings of the more peaceful era. At 4 o'clock this afternoon, Havana time, the opening session will be held. When this meeting is over, the real work of the delegates will begin, for the most part behind locked doors. This does not mean abandoning democratic procedure. On the contrary, it means speeding up democratic methods to deal more efficiently with the crisis at hand. Doubtless, there will be smoke-filled rooms in the traditional manner of political conventions in the United States. But such action behind the scenes will be in the hands of economists and diplomats seeking means to both the defense of the Americas. There is no room for political self-interest for Havana today. The United States delegation to the conference is composed largely of economic experts. This suggests that a large part of the emphasis will be on devising means to bring into operation the program of economic defense announced by President Roosevelt about a month ago. An essential feature of this plan is the creation of, and I'm using the President's own words, an appropriate inter-American organization for dealing with certain basic problems of their trade relations including an effective system of joint marketing of the important staple exports of the American Republic. The United States recognizes the fact that preservation of the United Front of the Americas will depend upon economic as well as political factors. The Washington administration has committed itself to protect Latin America from political penetration through economic means. Essentially, this involves assuming responsibility for Latin America's economic welfare. At present, the chief danger to the solidarity of the Western Hemisphere lies in the possibility that Germany, having secured control over Europe, will launch an intensive trade drive in Latin America. This drive is not feared because of its economic implications. The United States is not particularly concerned over selling more goods to Latin America. We are, however, deeply concerned over the development of a Nazi foothold in any section of the Western Hemisphere. And a Nazi foothold, or even complete political domination, has become a byproduct of Nazi economic penetration. A German-dominated Europe would require vast quantities of the goods that Latin Americans produce: cereals, cotton, coffee, meat, oil, and metals, to mention a few commodities. They would have great manufacturing capacity for supplying finished products in exchange for Latin American raw materials. Since the United States, under normal conditions, takes no more than a third of Latin America's exports, while Europe buys more than half, Germany's bargaining position would be much stronger than our own. Therefore, even if they detested the political philosophy and trading methods of Germany, individual Latin American countries with heavy surpluses of raw materials and food stuff could hardly refuse to sell on moral grounds. Asking alone, they could only deal with Germany on the latter's terms, despite the fact that such terms might ultimately involve political domination by Germany. 
Germany has already solicited orders from various South American countries and has promised fall deliveries of manufactured goods at prices far below those quoted by American exporters. On the eve of the conference here at Havana, Latin America has been subjected to a new barrage of Nazi propaganda. This propaganda is designed to woo or frighten these countries away from taking any steps that might be detrimental to trade relations with Germany after the war. One of the principal tasks of the United States delegation here at Havana may be that of proving to Latin America that this country can outmatch Germany when it comes to extending economic support. I cannot overstress the point that the keynote of the conference about to begin is defense and not merely neutrality and the peacetime economic cooperation of the American Republic. Defense, moreover, isn't simply a matter of building airplanes and battleships, or will this is, of course, highly important. Defense of the 21 American Republics also involves their political and economic coordination on a scale that would have been considered fantastic only a few weeks ago. This coordination is necessary both because the United States needs Latin America, raw materials, and Latin America needs the military power of this country. The whole question of economic defense is very much in the forefront of the banner today, yet it would be too much to expect this conference to draw up a complete plan of action. The most that we can expect is agreement in principle on broad policy. The actual details will possibly be referred to the Inter-American Financial and Economic Advisory Committee. This group was established by the first meeting of the foreign ministers of the American Republic held at Panama last September. The attitude of most Latin American nations towards development abroad suggests these countries are ready to join in a plan for economic defense. Yet, to keep the bond tight, the United States must be able to offer more than a victorious Germany could offer to Latin America. It is not so much a question of what Latin America would choose, but of what it might be forced to do under pressure. Germany is organized to exert that pressure, as well as to offer economic aid. No haphazard, lofty idea of Pan-Americanism will be sufficient to hold the American nations together after the war. The United States cannot expect financial and economic sacrifices for a political ideal. The goal of Western Hemispheric economic defense is not narrow imperialism. Although democratic forms and many of the rights of individual nations may be threatened in the struggle to meet the totalitarian challenge, the question of protecting American markets is incidental to the immediate issue of defense. It is also incidental to the ultimate objective of raising the standard of living in the new world. The latter will be an empty phrase, however, unless it is implemented by a program of Pan-American economic coordination. And this economic coordination must be on a scale far exceeding that which democratic methods have been able to produce in the past. And now Mr. McCulloch will address a few words to our Spanish-speaking audience. Mr. McCulloch. Buenas tardes. La señor True Blood acaba de tratar lo que es sin duda el problema capital para resolverse en esta conferencia de los cancilleres americanos, a saber la defensa económica del hemisferio occidental. Siempre con este problema van otros tópicos de índole política. Además, toda decisión tomada en esta conferencia sobre asuntos económicos implicará forzosamente cierto grado de colaboración política más estrecha. Los acontecimientos de las últimas semanas han concentrado nuestra atención sobre un sinnúmero de nuevos problemas en el terreno político. El derrocamiento del ejército francés y la posibilidad de que Francia surja como un estado satélite del Reich alemán pone de relieve la importancia de la discusión acerca de las posesiones europeas en el nuevo mundo. En La Habana, este asunto será sometido a un estudio minucioso. Distintas soluciones han sido propuestas. Hace pocas semanas, en una conferencia del Caribe celebrada en la República Dominicana, 
el ministro de Relaciones Cubano habló por un protectorado común sobre esos territorios del hemisferio occidental, los cuales de otra manera caerían bajo el dominio de poderíos hostiles a los ideales e intereses americanos. La reciente investigación de las actividades nazistas en el Uruguay, realizada por el gobierno uruguayo, ha despertado un interés enorme en las actividades de la quinta columna en todas las repúblicas americanas. Se ha propuesto que las naciones americanas mantengan un cambio de información irregular como un medio de combatir a los miembros de la quinta columna. Por último, para también discutir posiblemente el fortalecimiento de la maquinaria consultativa en las Américas. Hasta que grave la cuestión de la propia defensa física del hemisferio figurará en las instituciones no se sabe todavía. Los Estados Unidos no han enviado ningún asesor militar ni naval. Algunas repúblicas han manifestado permanente que son de sus poderados, no están autorizados para asumir obligaciones militares. Sin embargo, se ha expresado en ciertos círculos el deseo de que este tópico no sea del todo ignorado. Por ejemplo, el señor Carlos Evia, ex presidente de la República Cubana, y graduado de la Academia Naval Norteamericana de Anápolis, ha propuesto que la conferencia de la Habana cree una patrulla naval bajo un mando unido. En cuáles cualesquiera decisiones que se hagan en cuanto a asuntos militares, en la conferencia o en las negociaciones separadas, se dará especial importancia a la acción común. No se contempla hegemonía estadounidense alguna. Aquí, por ejemplo, todo arreglo hecho con relación al uso de bases aéreas será recíproco y de mutuo acuerdo. Muchas personas se han quejado de que varias importantes repúblicas latinoamericanas no han enviado ministros de relaciones a la conferencia. Esto no indica necesariamente una falta de interés o un afán de sabotaje de la reunión. En el caso de las repúblicas más al sur, el viaje hasta la Habana es muy largo y asuntos urgentes hacen casi indispensables la presencia de los cancilleres en sus respectivos países. No debió olvidarse que el secretario de Estado norteamericano, el señor Howe, no encabezó la delegación estadounidense a la conferencia de Panamá en el otoño pasado. En resumen, las cuestiones de la Habana reunirán a un grupo de hombres distinguidos y competentes. A ellos les corresponderá tomar decisiones en un momento que es tal vez el más grave de toda la historia de las Américas. You have been listening to Mr. Howard J. Trugrod and Mr. John I. D. McCullough of the Foreign Policy Association who spoke to you direct from Havana. If you would like a free copy of this talk, send your request to the Foreign Policy Association, 8 West 40th Street, New York. The Foreign Policy Association is a nonpartisan organization open to all who are interested in American foreign policy. It offers accurate information on current world events. In the world of today, foreign affairs are your affairs. We invite you to tune in next Sunday to hear another speaker in the America Look Abroad series. We return you now to the National Broadcasting Company, New York. <laughs>